What I would like to invite you to do is, <clears throat> some of the questions are directed to people in particular, but please feel free to weigh in, and this is just a conversation that will be really beneficial, I think, uh, for everybody to listen into. So let me get us started with a, what I hope is a fairly simple question, a fairly interesting question. Maybe each of you could tell us, what is your favorite book or favorite books on preaching and why? What's your favorite book or favorite books on preaching and why? I can start. <clears throat> um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I, should I speak to you or to them? I, why don't you speak to them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, my favorite or most impactful book on preaching in my life will be obscure probably to a lot of you if you're under the age of 50, and it's Sidney Gray Donis' book, yeah. first book on Sola Scriptura, huh. mm -hmm. uh, because I thought it was quite penetrating into the situation of the Dutch Reformed Church and his ass assessment of that, which I saw at that time in my own life, <clears throat> and as well as in the Reformed churches in America, yeah. and I thought it was it was striking. His later book, the larger book, what is you probably are more familiar with, uh, is is fine, but it wasn't decisive yeah. like that. I okay, mean. so that was formative. Great Dennis, yeah, Rob. Uh, uh, yeah, it seems like it should be an easy question, yeah. but uh, it it's not. I uh, preaching in biblical theology by by Clowney. Um, uh, Lloyd Jones, uh, preachers in, in preaching. Um, I also, you know, Sid, Sidney Great Honest, we had to, to read that when I was a student here. And, but there's some, some others. Um, oh, names are escaping me right now. Um, a Tyndall lecture uh, delivered another uh, d professor at Compton Theological Seminary, Preaching in the New Testament was the title. And I, I forget the name. Of, of the man who wrote it, but it was just a, a careful uh, exposition of the various terms for preaching in the New Testament, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, which painted a, a fuller picture of everything that preaching entails. Um, and, and so that was uh, a very formative for me as well in yeah. various uh, simple, straightforward way. But uh, those are kind of you know, yeah. somewhat standard, That's but... That's yeah. great. I, I think for about the first seven or eight years of my ministry, John, I read Lloyd Jones mm. preaching and preachers. Mm -hmm. um, it was delivered here. It's yeah. a series of lectures, right, 1969, right. Yeah. I think. Um, and he focuses so much on the personal aspect of preaching. You know who you are in yourself. Yeah. You know your own relationship <coughs> with the Lord is so important. So, as an encouragement to preaching, I, I think mm. it's just a super, super book. Right. Technically. Uh, Maybe not offering so much in terms of how to put a sermon together right. or anything like that. Um, Dennis Johnson has an excellent, mm -hmm. excellent book, Him We Proclaim, Him we proclaim which yeah. is uh, yeah. very, very good indeed. And, of course, Tim Keller has a recent book on preaching, which is also enormously yeah. helpful. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable how, how many people, the, almost a few generations, have been so shaped by that Lloyd-Jones book. Yeah. And almost across... Across traditions and denominations, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Moeller, how about you? Well, I find this to be a very frustrating question. <laughs> and uh, I'll admit that I am horrible at answering any time and, frankly, a bit irritated. <laughs> when someone asks me, what, what book do you think is best in this area? Or this? Yeah. Sometimes I have an answer, but usually I don't. Yeah. And it's because I recognize in the seventh decade of my life, which seems mm. impossible to say, mm. that... Uh, Books affect me at a time hmm. Hmm. and with a significance and an influence that I only understand in retrospect. Uh, I was, uh, you know, as a young person, a uh, Christian young person, you know, just kind of tossed around with all kinds of ridiculous and unbiblical notions of Christian spirituality. And then InterVarsity Press publishes J.I. Packer's Knowing God. Yeah. And it was, it was life transformative. Yeah. Now, I won't say that, the entire trajectory of my life is based upon you know just what Packer was talking about there, but but shifting to a God-centered spirituality right. was just a massive thing. I will now look back and say, I knew that book had a big impact on my life when I was 18, but I now know it was a trajectory kind of directing book. So I mm -hmm. you know I have no uh, no recourse but to mention 
Preachers and Preaching by yeah. Lloyd Jones. Yeah. <laughs> because that book, in retrospect, yeah. was the most important, and also being able to hear some of it. Yeah. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. it was, it was life-changing, partly because I'm trying to figure out what expository preaching is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hear Lloyd Jones, and I think I know what he's doing, but how great is it to hear him talk about what he thinks he's doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what made that book. And it's just plain mm -hmm. spoken, you know, delivered his lectures here. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 I will also tell you that one of the most influential books in my life is the, in preaching is written by David Buttrick, the son of George Buttrick. Because mm -hmm. every once in a while, you read a book that's so absolutely wretched. <laughs> And, and, and yet so kind of competently systematic. Yeah. You look at it and go, okay, I think this is the quintessential statement of what I'm not trying to do. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that can actually, it's right, like reading Bultmann. Yeah. You know, you go back and say, well, that's exactly what I'm not trying to do. <laughs> kind of helps me to focus on what I'm not doing. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, that, the, the books like that can sometimes have a catalyzing effect and, and I also say that I have a practice, and I, I uh, talk to students about this, I have a practice of trying to figure out the books that most form me and then rereading them at least once every day. Mm. And I buy a new copy, or at least a new used copy, and I mark the way I mark, and I can look at successive decades of my life and see that in a Venn diagram, maybe 70% is commonly marked, but the other 30% tells me how this particularly affected my thinking at this point. Mm. Fascinating. And so I've done that with uh, Preachers and Preaching. Mm. And uh, it's a lot of red. A lot of red. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and I, I realize it's, it really has been so influential in what I think about preaching. Yeah. Well, it's a, such an influential book. You know, in 2019, we did the, uh, the whole preaching conference on that book and, mm -hmm. and Martin Lloyd Jones. Well, let me, Dr. Morrill, let me start with you, and then maybe we'll go to Dr. Pratt and make our way around here. Um, Last night in the address, we were uh, encouraged, challenged, uh, exhorted that as preachers, we need to learn how to understand the language and the worldview of those to whom we preach. Um, that's always changing. And keeping up with it can be a great challenge. So maybe we'll start with you and we make our way around. How does a preacher keep up? How does a preacher stay informed in what those to whom he's preaching are thinking? And do you have particular habits, tools, resources you'd recommend? Well, a part of what I've tried to do for 30 plus years is this kind of cultural analysis and to learn and earn the skills in cultural analysis. And a lot of it, I mean, it takes an enormous amount of time. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why I try to kind of help others with that kind of, uh, that kind of analysis and thinking. But it requires an awful lot of conversation an awful lot of listening to the world at work, at talk, at think, insofar as it thinks, insofar as those things turn out to be even closely related. Mm. Yeah. But nonetheless, uh, I, I, I think we have to be very watchful, very sensitive just by hearing the, the gestalt, the worldview, the mentality of, of, of the world around us. And that requires us getting outside our comfort zone I would have said at a different point, I think uh, one thing every preacher probably should at least consider doing is looking at uh, the top 10 best-selling uh, fiction books. Mm -hmm. And trust me, you don't want to read all of it, but uh, you know something off that list you ought to read just to find out what is a best-selling narrative, mm -hmm. plot, um, yeah. dramatic tension, uh, what questions are people asking. And, and right now is a, an extremely fertile moment for that. Uh, just an incredible number of releases in the, uh, the, the world of, uh, uh, of literature, Western literature, in which it is just simply directed towards the uh, dissolution of the entire society, the loss of all meaning, the breakup of every marriage, the, uh, the wounding of every family. Yeah. And uh, so you look at that and you recognize there's something going on there. And I, I'm not going to give here what I'm going to preach about shortly. Uh, once will be enough. 
Uh, but I, I'll simply say I, there, there's no way comprehensively to do this. So my other fear is that too many preachers will give too much time to this yeah. uh, rather than to exegesis and uh, to the study of Scripture and to exposition. And so it needs to be a background skill for most preachers, not a foreground skill. Hmm. And, and I hope that makes sense. Yeah. It needs to be something you're attentive to, you're listening for. You give some time to thinking through. But uh, the main thing we need preachers to do is to study the scriptures and get into mm -hmm. the pulpit and teach and preach the scriptures. Mm -hmm. That's where we need to start and stop. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Dr. Pratt, uh, how do you keep up? How do you stay well, in You point? keep up very easily by listening to a daily podcast. By <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's easy. We're done with that, okay? That's, that's, that's the simple part. Uh, the difficult part, however, is... Especially, especially, I would say, for younger students, for people who are students at this point, you're about to go into ministry and the like, there's a natural tendency as someone who's been to school recently to think that uh, the challenges that you'll face in ministry from the world around you and the language you need to learn, the ways they think about things and that sort of thing, is an academic pursuit. Mm. Let me just tell you, most of the people with whom you'll minister do not have a clue of any kind of academic, right. scholarly, even literary, for that matter, background um, that is impacting them. Uh, they're they're YouTubing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're going. To, they're watching. Not going so much anymore, but go, watching movies, and their world is being shaped by that. And I don't just mean teenagers. Mm -hmm. I mean adults, <laughs> middle-aged people, even older right. people, for that matter, at this point. And so when you, when you try to minister to people who are, or shall we call it, I want to say the good people out there, or the ordinary people with whom you'll be working um, and serving, who are going to work every day, who are going to school every day, who are living with other people all day long in real life and not in the bubble of the academy, um, you, you must find avenues for learning how those people's lives are shaped and <clears throat> impacted by sin and impacted, of mm. course, by common grace. And I think that some of those um, means that they use are the same means that we can use to find those things out in addition to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. It solves all other problems, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, and I, echoing some of that, I, I think of just the need to be critically aware of how we ourselves are involved in the world. We're not... There's a real sense in which we're not foreigners to our culture. We inhabit it as well as we participate in its media uh, and its literature, um, its uh, various forms of entertainment and reflection. And I, I think the more we're simply critically aware of our own involvement and how our own hearts are drawn and attracted, then we'll understand the world in, in which we live. I, I'm the father of three college-age kids uh, and, and so as you're critically aware and interacting with your children uh, and, and seeing the impact of the world and the way they're thinking, even as those who've, who've grown up in the church, the allure of those things. So I think as we're aware, uh, not countering anything, affirming everything that's been said, but simply being aware of our immediate surroundings and, and those pulls in our own hearts and minds and, and those who are near to us. You spoke to that uh, yesterday, um, uh, that that helps immensely. I think there's also a danger. J. H. Bobbing uh, addresses this in, in his book, The Introduction to Science, uh, uh, Science of Missions. How we can uh, we can see people simply as a, an embodiment of their worldview or their religion, and therefore we can, if we study it simply at an academic level, we can see people simply as academic embodiments of, of a postmodern worldview or, or a particular religion. And, and Bob Inc. says, if we do that, we miss them as a real person, as an individual. And so I think it's the danger. Uh, we need to be aware, critically aware of systems, but we can't treat people simply as manifestations of those, symptom, those systems. And I think we have to be aware of, of that, that we're, that we're addressing real people. Uh, who've been influenced and shaped by many, many different things in their lives. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with what you guys have been saying totally, you know, if it were not for what Al's doing in terms of 
offering us an analysis of culture. Th that's enormously helpful, brother. Mm -hmm. And yeah. on behalf of everybody here, we thank you for that. Um, because I don't have the wherewithal, I don't have the time, I don't have the ability uh, to do all that. As a pastor, what I do have time to do is to sit with my people and to talk to them. Uh, so I'm not sure what the practice is in North American churches these days. And certainly since COVID, it's a global issue that the opportunities for pastoral visitation have been greatly mm -hmm. reduced. But I would say prior to COVID, just the opportunity to spend time with your people, listening uh, to their struggles, listening to their frustrations. And many of them are working hard to figure out how does my Christian faith relate in this set of circumstances? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and listening so carefully to them so that that inevitably impacts your preaching because you're preaching then to a particular settled congregation on the Lord's Day really becomes a group counseling session. You know, you're bringing God's mm -hmm. word to bear on the particular issues that these folks are struggling with. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you say, Rob, you know, we're all breathing in the toxic fumes of this culture. And it's very, very hard at times for us to breathe the fresh air of the kingdom of God. Um, and if we find that difficult, our people struggle even more. Um, so we have maybe an hour or two hours on a Sunday, maybe. <laughs> Who knows, do we get even an hour during the week? And we're inducting them into a different atmosphere where we're saying, breathe this stuff. This will mm -hmm. invigorate you. This will help you as you go out uh, into, the, into the rest of your life. Dapper, let me come back to you with the, on, on that pastoral note and uh, address one of the questions that was raised to us. So as you're listening to your people, we're listening to ourselves, we're listening to Dr. Mueller's podcast. Um, <laughs> how do you decide what topics of public or cultural interest you should address? In other words, what's the pastor's <clears throat> grid? What's the decision-making process? Say, I should address this, I shouldn't address this. How do you work that through? And mm. others feel free to weigh in on that. I, I think you allow that to arise from the text of Scripture. Mm. You know, what, what you take your starting point where you're, you know, most of us work a, a series of sermons, working our way through books of the Bible, or through a series. And as the topics come up there in Scripture, you know, you're not preaching long before you'll cover a number mm -hmm. of, of relevant contemporary yeah. issues, yeah. Uh, no matter whether Old Testament or New Testament. Uh, so, um, I, I would take my cue primarily from the text of Scripture that I'm, I'm dealing with, but trying to see how that uh, relates. What, what's, what's the point of connection? Um, Brian Chappell has the helpful uh, tool of the fallen condition focus. Yeah. Um, what do we share with the people to whom this text was originally addressed? What, what is the issue of belief or unbelief or struggle in which we, as part of a fallen, broken world, uh, share that same concern. One of the beauties mm. of sequential exposition, isn't it, that when, as you, if you're paying attention to the text and paying attention to your people, that you address so many issues. You yeah. can't avoid them, and so often you, you also, it's, you're not accused of just hobby horsing on them. Yeah. And you, you have to address the whole panoply of human issues as you preach through the text. Dr. Moore, how do you decide? Where do you, where do you, where do you go? Well, like you, I'm committed in the pulpit, as we discussed here, to sequential biblical exposition. Uh, this past Lord's Day, I finished more than a year of a series at uh, our church, a Sunday morning series, uh, in the hour of exposition before the worship. So I do, a, I do the expositional hour in the morning. I just finished more than a year in Leviticus, which uh, I will just tell you uh, earns a certain form of merit badge in expository. <laughs> now, even to read some of it out loud when you got 12 year olds and 85 year olds, uh, uh, you know, and you find yourself talking about things they never expected you to talk about. <laughs> but I, I just finished with uh, 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 Christ in Leviticus. And uh, the amazing thing is, is that the crowd for Leviticus grew every week over the course of that period, because I think, again, it shows you the power of the Word of God. Um, 
I, I agree with basically everything that, that uh, has been said. I just want to say that there, when, you, when it arises from the text, you need to realize that, that we're working in a conscribed amount of time right now. You might say a compressed amount of time. And so let's just talk about the formative years. You've got someone between, say, 14 and, and, and 18 in high school or, uh, or 10 and 12 in middle school. Um, I mean, I, I spent one period of my life, you know, with the three and a half years in the Gospel of John. Um, I wouldn't take that back at all. But I do recognize that when we talk about it being in the text, we need to understand the ontological, creational, biblical, theological, uh, ethical, current issues that a 15-year-old needs to hear declared from the Word of God. And so it's not just that this text speaks to that, but it speaks to the goodness of creation order, which leads us to remember why marriage is so important and fundamental in the flow of biblical history and, and, and our understanding of, uh, of even the, the work of Christ. And, and in other words, I, I, just, I, I think, for instance, uh, I hear people say, you should only mention this as mentioned in the text, but that would help to explain why Almost no evangelical had ever heard a sermon on the sanctity of human life uh, in the 1970s. And so th there's something wrong with that. If what we're doing is saying, you just talk about what is the first reference of the text here. Reformed people are supposed to be better than this anyway. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think that, that speaks yeah. to something that Stafford was bringing up, the, the emphasis on general revelation. Right, that that uh, God has revealed Himself once for all in His Word, conclusive speech centered on Christ, but there is His ongoing revelation that surrounds us in the world, and and I do think there there are times when we can pause and speak to those issues when questions arise. I think of Jesus in Luke 13, where people ask about the Galileans who were whose blood was mingled with the sacrifice and. Uh, where they were sinners. Uh, and so here's an event that provoked questions to which Jesus, the self-attesting Christ of Scripture, he spoke and appropriately interpreted those events. Or the Tower of Siloam that fell on these 18 people and, and killed them. And so I think as a regular course of our ministry, we're preaching through the Word, which gives opportunity, opportunity to interpret people's experience in the world. But I do think it's appropriate for those who believe in God's ongoing active general uh, revelation, uh, that there are occasions and events that require interpretation yeah. that we can bring God's word to bear in relation to his world um, in view of those events that raise questions uh, for, for people. So yeah. I think that's an appropriate yeah. thing to do on occasion. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Might, I, might I add to that? I certainly agree with everything that's been said. This is not, the count, not a counterpoint, but it's simply to add this feature, and that is if we are doing even close to halfway thorough an interpretation of the original meaning of a portion of the Bible, say a chapter of the Bible or five verses of the Bible, there is going to be so much there <laughs> that it will be impossible for you to put it into a 30-minute sermon. Now, if you're not aware of that, then you're not going to be aware of the fact that you will be making choices. You'll just be thinking, I'm just preaching the text. But actually what you're doing is making lots of choices. And so if you're not aware of how much you're truncating your focus, then your choices will be made haphazardly. Sometimes Holy Spirit likes to do that to us, and that's a wonderful thing. But ordinarily, he works through us, right? Through, without, above, and against. Please tell me. You got it? Okay, you got the reference. And, um, and so um, if we can become more conscious of the fact that we must be making choices, then the questions start arising, well, um, based on what criteria? There we go. Um, what's happening around, what's happening to those people out there. Mm. It's, it's, I know this is going to sound, I know this is going to be so unorthodox, I, I dare not say it. I'll go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I have the privilege of being an itinerant preacher, okay?
okay? But I have, for years on end, preached regularly in a pulpit in a church as well. So I, I understand the difference between being itinerant and, and someone who's with the same people day in, day out, that sort of thing as well. But uh, the reality is, is that there's a risk that needs to be taken even in the moment of preaching. And that is when you stand up in that pulpit and you look out and you see who is there that day. Mm. Did I do that yesterday? I said, mm -hmm. he said, uh, my, my handler was asked me, what are you, what are you <laughs> gonna talk about? David over here, he said, what are you gonna talk about? I said, I will know when I stand up and look out and see who's here. Mm -hmm. And some of you thought I was just being friendly when I was shaking your hands before the hour started. I wasn't. I was investigating Research. who in the world is here tonight. Now, I know that's risky. I know it is. But in some respects, I like that risk because what it makes me do is seek the, Lord, the filling of Holy Spirit rather than just simply um, talking to myself, if you hear what I'm saying. And so prepare, yes. But if you've prepared fairly well, you're going to have far more than you can possibly put into a 25-minute sermon, even a 45-minute, as you gave me last night. Mm. Just far more. And so looking in the eyes of people, seeking the leading of Holy Spirit in the moment can shift your focus on how you deal with the objective things that are in the text and their Christ-centeredness, as well as the general revelations part of it right there. Mm -hmm. That's momentary at that moment. And that, that becomes a skill I think we all need, really need to develop because I think, I think honestly, that's what Jesus did. And I think it's what the apostle did. And I think it's what other Old Testament writers did with earlier texts that they were interpreting too. Um, so there's, that's my heretical statement. But, yeah, what, I think your saying comes back to talking where Stafford was, know your people. That's mm -hmm. right. And, and yeah. where, where's their life? Where are their challenges? You have to know your people. How do you know your people? Yeah. So speaking of biblical exposition, uh, Dr. Edwards, let me ask you this question. You provocatively said, uh -huh. exposition is not enough. Yeah. And then you looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> knowing I knew it would be provocative to you. Knowing you were provoking something. <laughs> but I thought that would be worth us talking about. What were yeah. you trying, what, I mean, you said it clearly, so I don't want to sound yeah. like you were trying to say it and didn't say it. What were you saying? And yeah. let's talk about that a little bit. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's where I was discussing the complex of words that, that are used by Luke to characterize Paul's preaching. And, uh, and, and I, so we, we tend to think of exposition, at least I tended to think of exposition merely as explanation of the text or maybe explanation and application of the text. But as you look at what Paul was actually doing, and if our preaching is built on the foundation of, of the apostles and, and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone, um, well, what was Paul doing? Uh, he, he was persuading. He was reasoning uh, along with explaining. Um, he was speaking boldly. He was proving. Peristemi is the, the word there. And, and so my, my point was, um, true, if you, if you want to take away the provocative portion, true expository preaching must aim to do all of those things. And so I was challenging a superficial view of, of expository preaching, which simply means if I just explain what is here and make a few applications, then I've been faithful and done my job. When actually, if you look at apostolic preaching, more is involved, uh, that, that aim to persuade and to reason from the Scripture uh, unto persuasion in a way that provokes people, provokes questions, challenges. And, um, and I think that's where generally you know, we're, we're weak. We, we do a good job training uh, in terms of correctly exegeting and then explaining and, and maybe some work on application, but those other factors I don't think we've given due attention to. So do you think, might we say that, uh, that biblical exposition is not just explanation? Yes, yeah. Or if you want to refer to it as exposition, we have to enrich what traditionally we've understood exposition to entail. So that At leads me to another question I'd like to throw out to the panel. Is, is application and persuasion of the essence of preaching? Have you preached? Can you preach? Have you preached if you've not 
tried to persuade, tried to apply, called for response? There are models of preaching where that's the case, right? So could I, and could I respond this please? way? It depends on what you mean by persuade, of course. Mm -hmm. And in a situation like this, the tendency would be to think in terms of an argumentative discourse, okay. Mm -hmm. okay? that you've got to present some kind of um, diatribe on some subject and with premises and conclusions that are drawn from it. Persuasion, however, and we should know this from Jesus, storytelling is extremely persuasive if it's done well. The impact, emotional impact on people as well as rational and intellectual of a well-told illustration, say a short parable, as it were, um, a shocking statement that you make that leaves people wondering, what was that again? Mm. Sorry, you have to look at the recording later. Um, shocking people, uh, telling the story well, um, I would I would even edge up to the entertaining, but I don't want to go that far, okay? But you understand what I mean. It's engaging. It's life-giving to them. It's It propels them, sometimes without the obvious um, syllogism. And so per, if persuasion includes those things, the answer is yes. I mean, look at politicians and how they persuade. Look at Jesus and how he persuaded it's a very rich idea, and that is exposition, or putting it out of. I mean, that's what it is. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, you think of Paul as he describes Scripture and what it's profitable for, right? Not only for teaching, but for reproof, uh, rebuke, you know, correction and training in righteousness. And so if that's what Scripture is for, and then, of course, in 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, he directs Timothy, therefore, to preach the word, to reprove, rebuke, uh, you know, exhort. And, and so he uses those same <clears throat> words. This is what Scripture does. Therefore, this is what you must do. And, uh, and, and so I, I think you know, in making sure we're incorporating all of those features into what we consider um, as our exposition is, is essential. Go ahead. <laughs> I appreciate all that's been said, and I don't mean to be argumentative. I just wish I could believe that the actual problem is preachers giving their congregations too much scripture and not enough mm. analysis. I just don't think that's the problem. Mm. Uh, the one thing I, when I teach preaching, the one thing I say to young preachers is, you gotta deliver the scripture in proclamation, exposition, behind that has to be exegesis, biblical theology, and if you run out of time, you're going to have to trust the Holy Spirit <laughs> will do that internal work through the internal witness that will apply the word in ways maybe you didn't have time to. And besides that, you're not competent enough to know exactly how the 14-year-old and the 85-year-old and others are, are, are need this text at this moment. And if you try to strategize all of that, you'll end up being Paul Tillich anyway. Yeah. And I mean that using Tillich as an intentional example. If you look up... In, in some encyclopedia of theology, apologetic theology from the 40s, Tillich is going to be who comes up and is answering theology. You know, the world asks the questions and, and, and the church responds with an answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to settle for that. Um, so I, I, I guess what I'm saying is every, I agree with everything that's been said. Absolutely. Uh, I just think that... Um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, Stephen King, the least likely person to be quoted <laughs> today. Uh, I think it was he who directed me to the statement by, in a lecture he gave, to, by Mark Twain, that there's no happier creature on earth than a writer not writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the speech of the agony of writing. And, and, uh, and, and then I will say sometimes I think that there's no creature on earth I'm so confused as the preacher who isn't sure whether he's supposed to talk about the scripture or about something else. And I just want to say, talk about the, talk, talk about the scripture. I don't, I don't discount anything. And, and if I were just talking to a group of pastors, I would say a lot of what's already been said. I would just say that you're less competent at reading hearts than you think. The Holy Spirit's sovereign at reading hearts. You're supposed to read the scripture and get it preached. And uh, I, I don't mean to 
suggest that it just ends with saying, you know, next time we'll start at the next verse. But I just, the older I get, I feel like I'm less competent at knowing how I'm supposed to apply this in the way that it needs to be applied to hearers in the congregation in ways I just don't even know. Some things I do know, I'm accountable to do with that. Lots of things I don't know. I have to trust the Holy Spirit will honor the preaching of the word. Let's move a little, thank you. Let's move a little bit to talking about uh, some of the issues uh, apologetically uh, and in preaching that we're having to, we're having to deal with in our culture uh, and, and how do we address it? So one overarching question that was raised um, is how do we think about the church militant in a world of opposition and yet, uh, as the questioner said, being as Christ gentle and lowly? or uh, perhaps the, the word that needs to be rediscovered, uh, meekness or forbearance. How do we think about being uncompromising, the church militant, opposed in the world, but yet with gentleness and respect, as Peter says to us? How do we, how do we tackle that? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think it's part of it, John, has to be telling a better story, uh, offering a significantly different alternative to what's being offered by the world. Uh, for me, I think the word is winsomeness, you know, where you're presenting the truth in a winsome way where you're dealing with real people in real situations. I'm not here to offend you particularly. I don't want to say anything that's going to be offensive, but you need to know that there's a better way to view this issue than the one you're suggesting to us. Um, and of course, I think Richard put it very eloquently last night, um, the nature of the society in which we live, where pastors and teachers and Christians are viewed not just as being old fashioned or irrelevant, but positively mm -hmm. dangerous uh, and, and quite evil maybe in what they're promoting. How, how do we tell our better story? Um, if an, on any social issue, whether it's the sanctity of life or marriage or even environmentalism or, or anything else, we're saying, uh, can you not see the beauty of, of all? I tried to finish today with Chalmers words, yeah. you know, where, where you see the beauty of this. There, there's something about this that is eminently more attractive than anything else that is on offer. Um, and I, I don't know how far that goes, but to say that firmly, uh, and, and to, to say, I'm not going down that road, and this is why I'm not going down that road, and this is why I'm commending this other route. Because this is be better. Because it's so much better. Yeah, you mentioned Keller's book on, on preaching in that middle section, Preaching to the Cultural Heart. Yeah. He, he, has a, he has a real, not that I agree with everything he says, but he has a real simple uh, pattern for doing what you just described, this yes, but Absolutely. no. yeah but yes. And so the yes affirms something that the, the, the non-Christian longs for or, or believes is true that corresponds because they live in God's world. It's the only world there is. They're made in God's image. It's inescapable. And so there's that point of contact that's assured. And so I think as we study a text that we're to preach, we can ask that question, what are things present here that unbelievers would affirm in some form or fashion? Um, yet then we can challenge them. The but no part is, is the challenge where we say, you, you want this, but you can't have it because it stands in conflict with other commitments that you have. It doesn't work. That's where you deconstruct right there their understanding or their desires, it doesn't fit with other commits. So you want justice uh, and you believe in, in some absolute justice, but you affirm materialistic evolution and these two things don't work together. And then the final but yes is to demonstrate how scripture and especially centered on the person and work of Christ actually provides for what you want, but you cannot have apart from him. And I think that's a simple model to keep in mind that yeah. yes, that, that point of contact and something that they affirm, but no, they can't have it. It's contrary to other commitments that they hold. 
But yes, the fullness of God's truth in Christ alone provides for that which you, which you long. And it's a way of challenging, yet also affirming a deep longing because they're image bearers, challenging them, and then demonstrating the, the beauty or the better story that alone is found in Scripture. How do we be, as Stafford put it, winsome, gentle, loving, but yet a church militant in a world apart? Well, I will just say, um, I think it's very important. I'm, I'll mention Charles Taylor in, uh, in my message forthcoming, Lord willing. But uh, one of the things that I obtained years ago, an intellectual toolkit, uh, you know, you're always throwing stuff in. One of the things Charles Taylor threw into my toolkit decades ago was his question about when ideas become culturally accessible. You know, it, it, but before this, it wasn't possible to think this way, like personal autonomy, just to give you an example. It just, you know, there, there's virtually nothing. There's an interior life in medieval literature. There's no notion of personal autonomy. So that, where does this come from? How, how, how does that arise? And, and, and then what are the effects of these shifts? Because the society tends to coalesce around these. So I'm headed somewhere with this, and that is that our call to be winsome and joyful and uh, to, to seek the good of the city and to, to care about our, our neighbors because they're made in God's image. Something has come between us in this age I think preachers just need to recognize, and that is this notion of uh, a morality of harm that now comes down to language. And I will talk about this more. But that's a huge issue. Uh, in a private meeting with the pastors, Tim Keller and I, and Tim have different approaches to this, but we, I think, respect one another tremendously. And uh, so, but anyway, this was the issue. We spent like an hour talking with pastors about this, the, the impact of the morality of harm and the idea of har language being harmful. And so... Whereas throughout the history of the Christian world, like the Apostle Paul, what the Apostle Paul is not dealing with in his apostolic preaching are people who claim that they're emotionally harmed by his preaching. At least there's no New Testament evidence of that. Uh, or, or that he's, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, dead name them. Um, it, it's, a, it's a different thing now. And I think that really makes the preacher's job so much more difficult. And I think it seeps into, as I was talking with some pastors of large churches in the SBC, um, and, uh, and a part of what they're getting in pushback from the pew is, I, I'm really uncomfortable when you preach about that. And it's, it's psychotherapeutic yeah. language now. Yeah. It, 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 it's not apologetic in the classical yeah. sense of agreement, disagreement, propositional statement, thesis, antithesis. Now it's very emotional. Psychotherapist is the new priesthood. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Can I? May I speak just for my own personal temptations in preaching? Um, I struggle with wanting very much to caricature unbelievers and struggling Christians. Mm. I really do. Mm. I mean, I, I just want to because you can do that easily because it's a one-way conversation. I've only had one person ever stand up in a, in a service in Tasmania, so where else would you have this happen, and start yelling, start shouting at me, okay, mm -hmm. for what I said. It was a Prezi church, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. This is actually happening. Mm -hmm. I think it's the first time anyone moved in that church on a Sunday morning, once they sat down, <laughs> and she was, she was going at me, because I was talking about relations of husbands and wives, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's easy, it's easy to caricature um, positions and or lifestyles and uh, the thoughts and the intentions of people um, when they're not talking back at you. So that's one side of the caricaturing, which is disrespectful, honestly. Hmm. I mean, if we make a straw man or a straw woman, whatever I'm supposed to say today, um, if we make a caricature, it's easy to just poke holes at it, and which is precisely what's going on right now in the debate, the political debates we're having for the midterm elections, isn't it? Mm. I mean, can you get anyone just to talk straight about this? Mm. And I watch it and I go, I don't think anybody's just, nobody dares to just speak plainly. It's always caricaturing the other person. But watch out now, there's a reverse caricature that happens too. 
The other great temptation is for me to caricature myself and the ones that I think are faithful. Mm. You know, we don't have that problem. If you, and if you'll just listen to what I'm trying to tell you in this sermon, your life will be as happy as theirs. Uh, you're right, okay? Uh, you know, it's, the, it's sort of reverting to the Pee Wee Herman uh, approach. I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> I know you are, but what am I? And you just run this circle over and over and over again. But the reality is... That, that trumps Stephen King. <laughs> in the yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. You sit there, and, and it's easy as a pastor to forget that it's important to make distinctions, like in Act 16, in my opinion, between victims and victimizers. I mean, some of the young people that you'll be dealing with, and perhaps even adults, are they're, they're victims of this um, shift that's happened. They're not the ones out there victimizing. They are just, they are worn down by this, and they are crushed by the pressure of the culture around us, including your own church members. They're just absolutely crushed and they don't need to hear a caricature. What they need to do is see your tears for their pain and their suffering. Does that, am I communicating? I can't see you, so a little amen from the back row would help. But you understand what I'm saying here, that this, this is extremely important, and it helps us be at war, but with respect and yeah, with gentleness. Sure. Yeah. And Jesus distinguished, didn't he, between victimizers and victims? Yeah. So how can we do otherwise? Thank you for that. Let me talk about the, the being sensitive on this and focusing in on it. I want to get to a question that's been asked that I think would help a lot of pastors, preachers. It's kind of really specific uh, to do with our preaching and persuasion apologetic and this, sexually, this sexual identity confused and chaotic context in which we are. Here's the question. Is, is in your way in as is, is you would like. How do we preach to someone whose identity is their sin? With love and meaningfulness, how do we persuade? How do we go to the conscience? Our congregations, uh, the, the context in which we preach, the people who are sitting there either openly or struggling, their identity is their sin. How do we persuade? How do we preach? How do we engage that kind of a question? Pastors are asking. So I can get past this really fast? I have to go first, okay? That's okay. Thank you. Here's the reality that I want to, I, I wish I could just convince you of this, but please contemplate what I'm about to tell you. It is far beyond likely that you have people in your church and especially the younger ones, by that I mean teenagers and above, who are wrestling with this thing so deeply, and they're so afraid that if they let you know that, that they will lose everything that's important to them being a part of the body of Christ. They're there. They are in your church. This is not something that's happening outside. And so I want to get past this really fast by simply saying, this is a very important issue of how you minister to people who are that um, inwardly, spiritually, psychologically, however you want to put this, um, confused and desperate for someone to care about them. And I just want to say that to you, so I'll just say it's hard. Yeah, yeah I, I think that, um, well, a couple of things. Well, I think we have to to preach our our true identity, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean always directly countering the identity that they believe is theirs. We know their true identity uh, as uh, image bearers of God, yet uh, uh, yet bruised and broken by the fall. And I, I think if we preach the fullness of, of, uh, of the identity of humanity and the full portrayal of Scripture, creation, fall, hope of redemption and restoration, 
that will reframe, hopefully, the way they think about their experience. You know, I think about, you know, within apologetics, some, oftentimes the best approach isn't a, a frontal attack where you know their defenses are best prepared, but it's along the edges where they're not expecting you to come. And so in our day and age where these identity issues, gender, sexual issues are so highly charged, um, so front and center, uh, probably the best approach to them is, is not always, or most of the time even, to address them head on in our preaching, uh, but, to, but to outflank them and come around the edges as we proclaim the true identity of, of who we are that resonates with their experience, and then as we bring Christ to bear to help them understand uh, what they need, right? Uh, the salvation that is offered, the, the hope of the gospel, and, and things along those lines. So just a few thoughts there. Incredibly difficult. Um, but I think Rob has really nailed it uh, by saying you've kind of, I have been inclined to desexualize the whole thing if, if we can possibly do that. And to talk about here's your true identity, and it's not necessarily focused just on who you see yourself in terms of your sexuality, um, but rather here you're a full person uh, made in God's image. Uh, let's not overcook or overplay the sexuality, because that's what's happened. Uh, suddenly, sexual identity has become politicized in, in such a huge way. I serve as president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And you took the risk of inviting a Baptist. <laughs> so, but at least it's truth in advertising and not like president of Imago. Uh, you knew what you were getting. Okay, so being a Baptist and believing in believer's baptism, I have a crisis point uh, in this that uh, I just want to articulate, which is I cannot lie in baptism. Um, I cannot allow baptism to be the occasion for a lie. We were talking, I, I mentioned you know, the idea of when ideas become accessible, you realize what we're talking about here would be completely uh, outside the imagination of a Martin Lloyd-Jones or an Ed Clowney. They have no idea what we're talking about here because th those ideas were not accessible. But I can't bring to the waters of baptism someone who is going to claim an identity that is contrary to creation and, and just isn't, cannot be made consistent with the trajectory of the gospel and the, the ontology of scripture. So I, I am answering as a Baptist to say that really does mean that I do not believe that in the church as the gathered community of believers, we can recognize a brother and sister in Christ without knowing whether they are a brother or a sister. I, 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 I mean, that's just, that's just a struggle. That's just where we are. And, and, and that is what we're being asked to do. That is what is being demanded mm -hmm, of us. Mm -hmm, right. and, and I don't think the Christian church and faithfulness can do this. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I do think it's kind of a moment like Barman when you recognize, okay, we do that. And we've lost humanity. We've lost right. ontology. We've lost, I mean, after all, John identifies Jesus as, as the one who made all things and through whom all things were created, who not only was with God, but was God. Well, I mean, so we don't have a gospel if we undo creation ontology. But then we say, well, those folks are quite broken. Well, we're all broken. And so baptism does not mean unbroken people come to the waters of baptism. It just means we have to confess our brokenness and, 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 and resign our ability to claim autonomy and identity on our yeah. own terms. So I'm just speaking, I, I can't preach this. I can just tell you, this is a huge struggle. But yeah. I'm trying to say to evangelical pastors, you can't, you cannot 
join in this confusion, mm -hmm. I think, and maintain the gospel. I yeah. just don't think right. you can. Right. Uh, I don't think you can have Redana's creation, fall, yeah. um, gospel, redemption, and, uh, and new creation if you get creation wrong in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. Yeah. So I, I just want to say, yeah. this is an ongoing struggle. I do think this is a bright line. I think it's a very bright line. And, and, and you know, the other day, not too long ago, I got on a plane, I sat next to someone clearly trans identity, non-binary, however you want to put it, but I'll just say had the hands of a man but was dressed as a woman. And, uh, you know, there we are sitting next to each other on a plane. And so what do we do? So I decided it's my gospel responsibility to initiate a conversation. I initiated a conversation. I said, hello, my name is, and uh, this man said to me, he gave me a female name. I did not say, I don't think so. Uh, you know, so in other words, missiologically, my responsibility is to seek to address them with the love of Christ, because what I wanted to do is affirm this is a human being made in God's image mm -hmm. who needs Christ as I infinitely need Christ, and I, I need to talk to him about Christ. And we never actually got to talking about the transgender mm. issue on this flight. I don't think I was a failure, I, I, but I, I didn't repeat the name back. I didn't, in other words, I didn't join the, I didn't affirm the misrepresentation. I simply sought to, uh, to find an opportunity to talk about Christ and the word gave me a brief opportunity. And uh, when that person gets off and Googles my name, <laughs> there's no telling what that response is. But, but nonetheless, I, 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 I do feel like on that flight, I did not betray the gospel. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't believe right. I did. Right. But at the waters of baptism, I would have betrayed the gospel yeah. Yeah. Uh, w w w without coming to a, a terms there. The hardest question I get right now from pastors, and sometimes just because of the public nature of what I do, I mean, I, I'll hear from several dozen people a week who will write in saying, I am trans, have been non-binary. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. I've even had what they now call gender-affirming surgery. I have since come to believe that was a horrible sin mm -hmm. and mistake. What do I do now? Yeah. And you know, mm -hmm. that, I just gotta tell you, the Apostle Paul never had to deal with that. But in the sovereignty of God, you or the students here, certainly at this seminary and younger pastors in this room, you're going to have to deal with that. And so get ready. Good. Thank you so much. We have time for just one more. Kind of I'm goal. sorry that took so long. That's the <laughs> other Baptist problem. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> we, we're not aware of any Presbyterians who have that problem. So. Okay. Right. If you believe that. <laughs> um, we, let me, we have time for just one more question uh, that I like to ask at the Q&A of our preaching conference uh, each year that I can. Biographies have been a huge influence for me, both in preaching and leadership. Mm -hmm. So if you're sending these preachers out of this room with one biography, I'm, I'm going to irritate you with this question, one book. Um, if, if, if you're sending, I'm growing accustomed to being <laughs> irritated by <laughs> <laughs> I'll figure out if there's a good thing. Uh, you, you, uh, if there's one book, one biography that, uh, that you want preachers to read, pastors to read, hmm. historically, contemporary, who is it? Who would you have them read? Didn't know you were going to ask me this. Hmm. You are not going to expect the answer. It's going to be short. It's going to be swift. It's going to be Harry Emerson Fosdick. Huh. Robert Motes Miller's magisterial biography of Harry Emerson Fosdick will be one of the greatest theological clarifying, theologically clarifying reads you've ever made. It will actually, you'll understand Machen so much better mm -hmm. when you read, because uh, Robert Motes Miller's a phenomenal biographer. And I'll just tell you that I just found that I, uh, and look, I'm not commending, <laughs> let's be clear, I'm not commending Harry Emerson Fosdick but I am telling you, you will think through so many of the issues and you will say, mm -hmm. okay, now I understand the antithesis in a new mm -hmm. sense. 
and you will be absolutely charmed by the writing mm. and by your understanding of American culture at the time. And again, such things as the institution, uh, we're privileged uh, huh. uh, to have hosting. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Oh, so difficult, yeah. isn't it? <clears throat> you kind of think, oh, why do you ask that? I don't know, it's frustrated as ah, it's <laughs> You're all irritated at me now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, yeah. I'm inclined to say Whitfield, huh. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. just as being inspirational and helpful. The Dalimore version? Yeah, yeah. 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 Thankfully, there's a shorter version. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. And I commend reading both, but the shorter version is a great place to start. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It, just excellent. Yeah. The, I have Dalimore. to choose one. That's what field that. Dalimore? Mm. Yeah, I also find it a difficult question. But uh, there's a, and I haven't completed it, but there's a um, biography of uh, J.H. Bovink um, that, I, that I think is, is useful, um, uh, maybe even for our purposes as well. Uh, it's, it's the... I can't remember his name right now. He, he wrote the introduction also to the J.H. Bovink reader. So as we've heard, Bovink, the nephew of the theologian Herman Bovink, who uh, pastor missionary in Indonesia and then served at Compen teaching pastoral theology and then for University of Amsterdam and uh, reflected uh, richly with, through his Reformed uh, heritage on, on the gospel in relation to the world. And, uh, and so I think it's relevant in terms of, of the things that we're facing, especially the way he, he, he uh, th uh, str thinks through general revelation and the way, similar, very similar to Van Til, the way he deals with, with Romans 1. He, Bob Inc., uh, J.H. Bob Inc. <clears throat> had a psychology background. That was his initial studies. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how it shapes and forms some of the language that, that he uses, yet clearly theological Yet he's thinking critically about about people's experience as he thinks theologically, and and so I think that's useful. Great, thank yeah. you, Doctor Pratt. An Anglican priest who taught in the religion department of my alma mater, Roanoke, Virginia, wrote a short biography of Jonathan Edwards, hmm. theology and life of, and. Uh, I find short biographies really good because they take you right to the point, but unfortunately, I can't remember the man's name. Google it, please, and uh, let me know. I think it's McCormick, I think is his name, but it's, um, it's short, it's 300 pages maybe, mm. and so for that reason, it went right to the heart of the matter, especially his, his religious experiences, which I find mm. the most fascinating thing mm. about him, frankly, because mm. mm. they were quite remarkable. Mm. Not a typical Presbyterian type. Fascinating. Thank you so much. On behalf of, of the conference, let me just say uh, thank you to all of you. This has thank been you. a terrific mm -hmm. Q&A and really enriching. Thank you so much. Yeah, you yeah thank you. Thank you.